welcome to Conversations with Kathy. And tonight, my special guest is Simon Stevenson, and he is the author of Set My Heart to Five, which just came out a couple months ago. And I know many, um, many people from the Troy Library Virtual Book Club are joining us tonight. So, um, so, but welcome to all of you and welcome to Simon. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm excited to be here with you all. Um... And full disclosure, everybody, um, I had the opportunity to talk to Simon way back in September when the book first came out. Um, and we, we, um, we chatted at a literati event for a literati bookstore in Ann Arbor. So, um, so we know each other a little bit. So um, we'll try to keep the, the private jokes about Elon Musk to a minimum, but, um, <laughs> but we're, old, we're old pals. So, um, so anyway, Simon, how's, how's life treating you since September? What's new? Uh, so, so, so life is treating me pretty good. Um, I am, um, what is new? We, so we've, we've launched a book. I've been doing lots of events uh, here and there around the country, obviously all, all virtually. Um, uh, I've been still working away on the screenplay of the book. So we're still, we're still hoping that there might be a movie of this someday, but no real, no real news on that so far. Um, and uh, I'm actually coming, coming to you today for, from Northern California. Uh, it's my, it's my girlfriend's birthday this week. So, so we're, we're on a very socially distant location in the uh, vacation in, in the Russian river area of Sonoma County. And, uh, if anyone gets the chance when life is back to normal, I, I recommend it as a nice, a, a nice spot. You can't go to the wineries right now. So it's almost like there's not much point in being up here, but it's, it's very, very beautiful nonetheless. Well, the socially distant part is probably, probably advantageous, right? It, 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 it's absolutely perfect. I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a cyclist is my, is, is my hobby and cycling in Los Angeles is kind of an extreme sport because it's so dangerous. And so here people seem to be much more uh, patient and tolerant and civilized to cyclists. And so there's just, yeah, like endless flat roads for miles. So it's, it's pretty great for that. And yeah, and you don't see anyone so socially distant. Perfect. That's cool. Oh, before I forget, because I already have forgotten, um, um, everybody who's um, watching tonight, We've disabled the chat, but you can ask your questions in the Q&A part, and we want to make sure to leave time for your questions. So you can certainly ask questions throughout the program, and we'll get to them in a little while after Simon and I have had a chance to catch up for a little bit. So don't hesitate to use the Q&A feature if you, um, if you have a question. So, yeah, get, get, get at us, absolutely. So Simon, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start and not be terribly original, but where did, where did the idea for Set My Heart to Five come from? Sure. So I had been trying to write a novel for about 10 years. I published a memoir about 10 years ago. And uh, after that came out and it did OK, it got some nice reviews. I'm from Scotland and it won a, it won a small prize in Scotland for, for best first book in Scotland. It may have been the only first book in Scotland that year. No one, no, 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 no one quite knows. So anyway, I decided I was a writer and that was it. And I was going to write a novel because that's what that's what people did. And I just I tried. I tried so hard. I started four or five and I just none of them really took and so then my life took this odd diversion where I wrote a screenplay that opened up some doors in in Los Angeles and I ended up living out in California and as part of that process I got a job writing a movie at a company in the in, in the Bay Area which was Pixar um, and so this novel came when I'd been in the Bay Area for a couple of years and there was kind of really these two um if you draw the Venn diagram of, 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 of where this book came from, uh, the shaded area comes from, um, one thing was just living in, in San Francisco and everything felt so, every second person I met seemed to be working at a tech startup or, you know, their job was like, they were like a corporate spy for Facebook or something. And, uh, um, and so, 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 so it felt like the world was sort of changing a bit too quickly for my liking that suddenly, you know, I stayed in a hotel one night and there was uh, a, a robot brought me my, my toothpaste for, for, for room service. Like, like, like I called down to reception and asked if someone could send up some toothpaste and what genuinely what arrived at my door was, was a robot and its head opened up and I, I, I took the toothpaste from it. So that like, was sort of- like, like like that one from i can't remember his name from like lost in space robot or like a Roomba yeah. or like yeah 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 so, so 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 it was more like i mean I, if any if anybody's a doctor who fan if if you remember the daleks who who are the sort yeah. of chronicle um so 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 i should profess this with like it was a very ordinary hotel so so, <laughs> so it was a it was a hyatt in the in in the less salubrious outskirts of oakland so it definitely wasn't any sort of fancy hotel i wasn't expecting this at all i'd I'd come back from the UK and I'd arrived late and I'd forgotten my toothpaste. So I called down 
because I was too lazy to, you know, walk down the five flights of stairs to the, and they said, yeah, sure, we'll, 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 we'll send some up. And, and 10 minutes later, there was a, like the doorbell on the room sounded and, and I opened the door and there was this thing and it's, it's head opened up and there was my toothpaste. And then I was so bamboozled that I, I followed it like all the way back down the corridor and kind of watched in, or as it summoned the elevator kind of wirelessly, like I saw, you know, the elevator call button. Uh, and then I got into the elevator with it and I started filming it at this point as we, you know, descended down in awkward silence to the lobby. And then when we got to the lobby, this thing just sort of trundled back and sat by the front desk. So it's so, sort of ready for its next, its next task. And of course it completely defeated the point of me, <laughs> you know, doing this because by now I had been down to the lobby, uh, but but that experience definitely changed me. I suddenly felt, well, we're really we're really here in the future. And then my my day job for those years, um, you know, people are probably familiar with with Pixar films, and I think the the hallmark of what they do is is emotion, and that's not it's not an accident. You know, that place is it's very much a laboratory for for the study of emotion in movies and how you um, generate emotion and make people feel things. So those seem to be the two circles and then the sort of where the, where those things the future and the screenwriting emotion overlap that's I think that's kind of where this book is and and it's never happened to me before normally when I have an idea of something I'm going to write I tend to have the idea you know 10 or 15 or 20 years in advance and I, and I kind of you know it's it's whirring there in the back and I'm sort of you know normally I think you know it's not going to work and I have to you know like I have to drag it out and beat it into shape and this one is, is I think it's the only time it's really ever happened to me where it's the second time actually happened in my life where I've just felt like I knew so, 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 so this idea and, and what popped into my head was the phrase screenwriting android and when that popped into my head I remember exactly where I was and when I was staying in the in San Francisco and it was a Saturday afternoon kind of coming into evening about this time of year, I think actually, and I um, I, I so, so this idea popped into my head, and I thought that's that's it, that's my that's my novel that I've been looking for for about ten years, and I took this big long uh, walk uh, down through kind of the Marina District, out onto Chrissy Field, along by the water, and up onto the Golden Gate Bridge, which of course um, is is the sort of um, that walk plays a pivotal part in the in 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 in, in the book. So um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think. Unfortunately, I think the lesson for me is that, um, you know, there's no point kind of working hard looking for ideas. I just have to wait. I just have to wait until they come. And that's, uh, I think that's how it's going to be. Yeah. Well, you know, that, but it worked, right? And, and so Jared is a dentist. And one of the things that I find so amusing is because, you know, he doesn't have to feel emotion or care when he's working on people. Yeah. Um, and I, I, but since you're in, well, you're not in Michigan, but you're talking to a Michigan crowd. Where did the idea come from to set it in Ypsilanti? Sure. So um, partly, I think, so I, th I think, again, I think, I think like, like everything always has a few reasons, doesn't it? So, so partly I knew that, you know, I knew Jared, want, he, you know, I wanted him to be a screenwriter and I wanted him to, to come from Cal come to California from somewhere else. Because um, obviously that's, that's what I had done. Um, and to kind of see California with, with, with fresh eyes. Uh, I think that um, Britain would have just been too, too complex and too far and it becomes, so, so, so it had to be somewhere in America. Um, uh, most, of, m most of the best friends I've made in, in, in Los Angeles are actually from the Midwest. Um, and, and, and like to a point where I think statistically it can't just be chance like 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 like, like there's you, you know there, and and they're not all Michigan you know you know some are some are Minnesota and things like that but that that definitely seems, seems to be a recurring theme um so the midwest was kind of somewhere i felt you, you know that uh, I, ha I had some sort of familiarity with and and my my former partner was from Michigan and, and so I'd spent quite a lot of time in Michigan um sort of uh outside Grand Rapids is is, is where they're from so, so I spent a lot of time around there so so I kind of knew that I wanted the character to come from somewhere sort of very just classically American in 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 in, in, in the best possible sense because I kind of wanted him to have you know a very nice kind of stable existence where um uh, you know, if 
if he hadn't had this malfunctioning in his programming, there was a perfectly good exist existence for him. Um, so I think that was sort of where it came from. And then Ypsilanti, I think I have to confess, like, I think I really just loved the word. I think it's such a beautiful word. And I listened a lot, um, you know, years ago to uh, Sufjan Stevens has his Michigan album. And uh, there's uh, all the songs are named after these beautiful names of these places in Michigan. And, and that there is an Ypsilanti song. And I think that was probably that that was probably where the word Ypsilanti first came into my um, ke, 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 came into my head. And um, yeah, I, th I think that was that 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 was, so, so it was kind of partly practical, but also partly, um, you know, Jared, I think kind of embodies you, you, you know, he's nice, you, you know, he's kind and, and he wants to be polite and he wants to do the right thing. And, and I think, you know, those are those are often more Midwestern qualities than they are intrinsically Californian qualities or, or, or East, quality, East Coast qualities, right? So, um, so yeah, I think that's probably part of it. <laughs> well, I have to tell you, um, my sister lives in Ypsilanti. So a couple of weeks ago, I went to visit my niece or to babysit my niece. So I was in Ypsilanti for about four days. And we went down to the park, the river, Riverside Park, and we passed the water tower. And I was like, mm -hmm. I, you know, <laughs> <laughs> sort of took on a different meaning for me now. <laughs> sure, wonderful. Oh dear, yeah. Well, don't I, I don't tell your um your, 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 your niece just yet. I suppose it's probably the innocence can uh, can survive uh, uh, longer. Yeah. Well, it's she. I think she's heard it before, but I thought, well, I don't want her to hear it from me. You know, we don't quite have right, to. quite right. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so then Jared goes across the country and it, one, of the, what, one of the things you said about seeing um, seeing um, the world with fresh eyes and seeing, you know, and, and Las Vegas, certainly. I mean, I felt like I saw Las Vegas through Jared's eyes, which are different from my eyes and saw it differently than I have seen it. And that was really cool. So did you did you know you were going to include Las Vegas or just because it's Las Vegas, it's so weird and freaky. Like you had to, because like, what would an Android do in Las Vegas? Like, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think it like, like, I don't think it was so planned. I think it was sort of when I began to think about how you get from uh, the Midwest to Los Angeles, I, I, I think, you know, I probably looked at the map and I thought, Oh, that's, that's, that, that that's interesting. And, and also I think kind of um, just in terms of like the arc of storytelling that, you know, he's kind of leaving one life for another life, and to make it like a bit less abrupt, it's probably good that there's that, that, that there's some kind of adventure on the way. And again, though, it's probably quite drawn from from life. That you, you know, I didn't go to Las Vegas until I was, you know, probably probably thirty eight, and so you know, you know, I'm you know, much as Jared is kind of you know, they're arguing about who the Rube is. Like in truth, like I'm probably the Rube, you know, because I'm the one that, you know, I went there, you know, with wide eyes. I, I couldn't believe how how, how how wonderful this place was. And in fact, I, I took my mum and she was even more wide eyed than me. She, she, she just loved it. We had this whole, um, I, it, her, uh, my mum and my stepdad came out to visit and I had this whole vacation plan that, you know, we were gonna go to Las Vegas and then we were driving to the, the Grand Canyon and we were at Joshua Tree Desert and just the whole it was like the great American West road trip and we got to Las Vegas and we spent a couple of days there and they didn't want to leave like like like, like it was very hard to persuade them to go to the Grand Canyon <laughs> because they said no no it's, it's fine here let's just let's just stay here I said Look, do you know how hard it is to book that accommodation in the national park like I, I worked so hard to to try try and get that and I entered the lottery and all of that stuff and they're like no let's just let's stay here and play cards so um so yeah well, just just give them give them the tokens and park them at the slot machine. And I mean, I I think that it, you know when when this pandemic's over and they come back, I think that will, you know it will just be three weeks in Las Vegas. That's what we'll do when when, when they come. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you, um, and I I know we didn't really talk before this, so I hope I'm not putting you on the spot. But um, no. some of the people um, in the various book groups listen to the the book um, on audio, and so. What I wanted to ask you, well, I wanted to ask you about the audio version. Do you have any input as to the reader, or you know, any any involvement in that? Yeah, so so so, so I had a little bit, um, which was just kind of listening to some samples of of, of of different actors. And the thing is, I guess it's you know, I'm a screenwriter by trade, so it's not it's not a million miles away from you, you know my day job. In in that I'm kind of you know 
quite interested in actors and acting and 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 that craft and how they do it. And I guess uh, you know, there's so many fantastic you know audiobook actors out there. And I think what really um, the the guy we have is called Christopher Ragland, and he's great. And I think what really tipped it for me was I was looking for someone with. Um, uh, like good comic timing, you know, and, and it's funny because we use that phrase and like, I never sort of like, it, it, it sounds so, 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 so reductive that, you know, because of course timing just sounds like, do you make the jokes at the right moment? And, and, and actually I, I, I think that's, that's true. That's such a skill and such an art, like, like, oh, like, gosh, like yeah. our best, you, you know, our best comedians. So like, you know, Jennifer Aniston, for instance, is someone who I think just, you know, is just one of the funniest actors on the planet because she's just, it's just the millisecond, the, 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 you know, the reactions and, and, and all that stuff. So, so yeah, I think we got very lucky with, uh, with, with Christopher and his colleagues because, because they all really managed to ma ma manage to nail the humor, I think. Well, and so what this is leading up to is mm. if, if you can, or like I said, I don't want to put you on the spot, but um, you know, people hear Jared and humans, I cannot, yep. ha, you know? Yep. So can you, can you do that for us? Like how you hear wow. Jared? Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, do you know what, let me, let, 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 let me, I, 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 I've got the book here. Let, let, let me just <laughs> see if I can just find a little, um, a little spot. Um, therefore, to humans in the movie industry, junior coder is better than software architect. Humans, I cannot. Um, like, 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 I think it's like, for me, it's sort of like, you, you know, he, he, it's deliberate, like it's supposed to be like a little bit off, right? You, 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 you know, that he's trying hard and, um, you know, he just, he wants to appear human, but he just doesn't, you know, doesn't, doesn't get it quite right. And I think, um, uh, that's I, I I I'm always so gratified when 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 people people get that like, like like I've had a couple of people say well he didn't sound very convincingly human and I've kind of said well it's kind of the point because he's um, not so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well if it's I'd like to go back um we were talking about a little bit about emotion and Pixar and yeah. um and one of the things that I loved about this book so much is that. I, you know, it was funny. I mean, laugh out loud, funny on every page, most every page, um, except when it was poignant. But the exploration of emotions that Jared goes through and to have sort of an analysis of what a particular emotion, d the definition of an emotion as understood by an android <laughs> was was great. I loved it. So like, where did that come from? How, what made you decide to be so specific about emotions? Sure, sure. So I was in, in my previous life, I was a physician and I was a, I was a children's doctor, which, which, which was my main, was my main job. And uh, I did a job for a while that was mainly working with kids with uh, autism, Asperger's syndrome. And of course, you know, part of those disorders is, you, you know, often to do with you know the processing of emotions kind of the understanding of emotions and a, a lot of times what we found or, or what seems to be the case is that you know it's not that people don't feel emotions it, it's you, you know the challenge is often in you know knowing how to interpret your own emotions or, or the categorization of them and I think as humans you know we're all sort of like can can, can sort of have have this problem sometimes uh in in in, in terms of you, you know, am I, you know, li 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 like in a sort of crude comic way, like, you know, am I depressed or, or am I just hungry? Like, like, like you, 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 you know, um, and so but my, when I worked with those kids, what, one of the tools that they used was, uh, and it's actually in the book, is, is, the, is the feelings wheel. And, and so the feelings wheel is, is a real thing, which, um, you, you, you know, you do give to people who, you know, sometimes struggle with, with, with identifying their emotions. Um, and you know a lot of times they find it very useful and in truth i think i i never had my own feelings wheel but but certainly you know working with those people i i did begin to kind of you know try and consider a bit more about like what am i feeling in this particular moment and and you know and, and i suppose it goes to like you know there's such a movement of of mindfulness now isn't there and and being in the moment and being aware of of of, of what we're feeling and i think um 
I, it's de it's definitely probably partly a journey I've been on of you know trying trying to recognize my own emotions, and then I think it's the you know the flip side is when I knew I was going to be writing about an android. Um, you know, the truth is they're going to be better than us at everything. You, you, you know, so like, like just literally everything um, with the possible exception of emotions. Like the only thing as humans that we're going to be able to do better is emotion. And so um, that felt like that was really fertile territory for, you know, this Jared who, you know, is just so, you know, smart in so many other ways and, and so logical and, you know, no doubt a brilliant dentist, but just you know, is like a toddler when it comes to, to emotions and can't really, can't, can't really recognize what he's feeling. Well, I love too that he can't, um, you know, irony and sarcasm because, you know, those Germans, they sure know how to have a good time. Yeah, 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 <laughs> Nobody yeah, knows how to party yeah, like the Germans. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the, one of the first places internationally that the book sold was Germany. And uh, I was quite worried about this. You, you, you know, I kept saying, look, have, have they read it? Have they read it all the way through? Are they, you know, you know um, so, 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 it, so it's not come out yet, but it looks like they're taking it in, 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 in a good, in a good fun spirit there. Oh, um, well, they know how to take a joke, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So there, are, I don't. There's a lot of relationships in the book, but Jared and his mom, and Jared and Amber, and I think also Jared and Inspector Bridges have sort of a yep. fugitive esque type, you know, yeah. quality there. Um, do you have? I mean, what do you think about that? Did you have a favorite part that you were writing in any of those relationships, or is there? Do you have a favorite part of the whole book? That you just think, oh, this is where I really nailed it. Sure, in, 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 interesting. I mean, I definitely, um, uh, I, I don't think I'd be so bold as, as to as to say this is where I definitely nailed it. You, you know, about anything I've written ever. Um, I think that um, certainly one of the things I, I had to do an article for, for, for a blog about, and 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 it was titled, you know, what's your what's your favorite thing about your book? And 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 I did think about it for a long time, and I think that what what I came up with for that, which I think is true, is the real joy for me was being able to write with enthusiasm because we live in such an age of like snark and cynicism and everything has to be, you know, LOL. Uh, you know, it, it's very hard these days to sort of, you know, be authentic and be honest about, you know, that we're humans and we have feelings and things make us sad and things make us happy. And I think the, the real joy of, you know, writing, in Jared's voice was just how how earnest he is and and, and how earnest that, that he gets to be like you know that he can say you know I saw the movie movie Titanic and I loved it you, you, you know which which you know it's probably true of me and, and it's something I don't I don't get to say you know, you know in my in my screenwriting job I, I go to these meetings with these you know fancy award-winning directors and you know, they ask you what, what your favorite movie is and you have to, you know, name some black and white Finnish movie from, from 1984. That's like a seven hour long documentary. And in fact, you know, if I was honest, I would probably be saying Sleepless in Seattle. It's a, I love it. You know, it's earnest and it's heartfelt and it makes me feel good. Um, uh, so, 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 so I think a big thing of um, pr pr probably the thing I like most and probably, you know, honestly, the thing I'm proud of is just you know the earnestness and and and, and the you know that the, there's a you know even though he lives in this world where you know planes have fallen out of the sky and all the rest of it um like hopefully there's a there's a hopefulness because a lot of times i think when we read about the future you know it's it's usually catastrophic right it's, it's usually we're reading about some terrible world where things have gone so badly wrong and so things have gone a bit wrong in this book but um you, you know there's still there's still hope and 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 i think writing about the hope has, was was good for me well, and, and that for me, honestly, reading it, because like I said, laugh out loud on just about every page, but there was just that poignancy and that, that sweetness and the, the emotion um, that to, for me anyway, it was an antidote to all the doom and the gloom and the, you know, everything that was going on, certainly in September with the pandemic and politics and, and all of that. Um, but then, so here we go. Hold on. Um, then the ending, I was like, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's left kind of ambiguous. I think a little bit like, so I can have hope that it didn't end the way that I think that it actually ended. Sure. But what made you decide to end it that way? 
Yeah, so 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 a, a really good question, and in truth, one that I haven't really been asked before. I think. Um, uh, so I think the. I, I, I mean, I mean, I think it was it was mainly to do with like feeling that Jared was on this journey of you, you know learning about emotion and kind of feeling more and more emotion. And then, you know, reaching kind of like, what is the, like, what's the most emotion a human can feel? And, and I was very, I, I, I tried to avoid doing this ending for a long time because, you know, I'm very sensitive to uh, the, you know, people taking their own lives. It's such a, you know, a devastating tragedy in our world. And, uh, you know, the last thing you want to do is, you know, in any way, minimize it or make light of it or use it for you know simply because it's a, a convenient ending to a story and you, you know I think I think I felt sort of um genuinely that you know that is you know that was the sort of natural ending that that, that Jared would go to I mean I think there's also this sort of like it's a bit it, it it's different because it's one of the models I had in mind was um, uh, an, another movie I love, which is Thelma and Louise. So you, you know, of, of course, I, I'm sure everyone's seen it. So so so, so I think I'll talk about it freely. Um, uh, you know, the ending of Thelma and Louise, which of course they talk about. You, you know, Jared talks about in the book. You know, he's it's the housewife and the waitress. Um, and and I think that um, obviously what happens at the end of that movie is you know they've used up all that all all that options that, that there's there's no way out if they if they go back they're going to go to jail and so 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 they choose you know to to die in glory and i suppose it's also uh you know butch cassidy and the sundance kid mm -hmm. kind of you, you, you yeah. know it, it, it ends his way so so so, so 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 there's quite there's quite a great tradition of it um in, in 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 the movies and obviously like part of the book part of the fun of the book was trying to find like like trying try, trying to bring some of the tropes from the movies to to a book and to do it in 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 in, in, in a sort of different way so um i i don't know like like i kind of i can't i i don't think there's a version where Jared's story would 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 have a happy ending. I mean, I guess if they, you know, you know, if 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 they somehow escaped, um, uh, but yeah, it 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 felt I don't know. It, it felt to me like that you you know he had kind of you know every every other possibility had 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 kind of closed off to him, and now you know by doing this thing, he potentially had this chance to you know to do what he wanted to do all along which which was which was to change the world for people like him um you know and as you say you know it is left a little bit open like you know we, we don't exactly know that you know how he imagined things to play out you know is how things played out um so so yeah i think it's good to we can leave that little that 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 that, that, that little bit of hope mm. i well and the thing is i i I'm sure you'll be delighted to know that I agree with you. Um, <laughs> um, but it's like, how else could it have ended? Right? right, right I mean, because, yeah. you know, then Jared moves to Montana. You know, it doesn't make any sense. And and yeah. yes, this way he gets to change the world. And I love the, the doctor, you know, the idea of the doctor sitting there reading the manuscript and, and going and doing his movie, you know, there's his movie career. And right. so almost everybody wins in the end but 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 Jared kind of wins too but sure, at the same yeah. it's just I loved him so much Jared so it was like yeah 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 no no I, I appreciate that and and you know my um I've got a cousin who I think still isn't speaking to me based on based on what happened to Jared at the end you know you know she 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 she, she was she was texting me all the way through like how much she was enjoying it and you know this happened and then this happened and this happened um and then uh yeah, suddenly went quiet and uh, got a very sort of like oh, was surprised by the ending, and it's been it's been quiet since. So 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 yeah, strong emotions uh, generated, I think. Yes, mm. yes, very much so. So we um we still have a little bit of time before the questions, but I do want to encourage um anybody who's um, watching, listening, um use the Q and A feature if you have questions because we're going to start taking questions in a couple minutes. But before we do that, I have at least two more things that I want to talk right. about. One of which is Elon Musk. What's he up to yes. these days? And, <laughs> and why Elon Musk as sort of the, um, 
the driver of the mystopian you've called it um sure. environment in which the, jared finds himself yeah yeah absolutely so so, so, so i'm sure everyone remembers what Kathy's talking about is um, uh, in the book that the moon has been incinerated um, and it's been incinerated by Elon Musk in, in uh, what was described as a hilarious prank um, and so, 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 so I should say that like in, in fairness to Elon, Elon Musk it, it really could have been any of the you know playboy space billionaires that, that we have right now and we have a few so you know Jeff Bezos is involved in that uh, Richard Branson, I think, is is a late mm -hmm. contender to the game, you know, and, and it seems to be that, you know, if you're a super billionaire, then, you know, it used to be that you bought a soccer team in London. But now <laughs> now what you do is, is, is you is you try and conquer space. And of course, what could possibly go wrong? Um, I mean, and everything, right? e everything could poss possibly go wrong. And that's sort of, you know, why we used to entrust space to, you know, nation states and, and NASA rather than just people people having fun so and but in, in fairness to Elon Musk this was um I was writing that bit round about the time uh he launched a Tesla Roadster in into space you, I, I don't know if you remember this that, that there was a sort of like he was showing off his his rockets capabilities and 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 they made this you know like like a Tesla but they strapped in these sort of two dummies to look like astronauts and sent it off into space and it's you know slowly making its way uh into in, in into deep space right now and, and again you know what could possibly go wrong well you know the aliens are going to find that and they're going to think that wow we need to find where all the teslas come from and they're going <laughs> to come to earth and be very disappointed that there aren't actually that many we don't all get one you know there's only a handful of people probably that have them um and it's gonna it's gonna be problematic so um uh it it sort of um he i guess at that moment in time he was already playing space pranks and uh i began to think about um, I think I think I knew that I kind of wanted the I, I, I wanted them to go for this walk in Griffith Park in the moonlight, and then I wanted you know I wanted to find a different. I was like, what if what if there isn't a moon? Um, and then, but then in terms of um, in, in 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 terms of what he's up to right now, I mean, I, I've been keeping a close eye on him because uh, I'm on, I'm on Twitter now, and he's he's obviously on he's obviously on Twitter a lot, and I've tried a couple of like like, like I've been sort of a little bit cautious about this that like. You know, I, I emailed, you know, when the book came out, I emailed like the, the SpaceX press office or whatever, you, you know, very, very delicately because, uh, you know, you don't want to get sued. And, and I, I would um, love I to think I just want to let you know. <laughs> yeah, 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 it, 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 exactly. So, you know, very sort of tentative and, you know, uh, making sure I make the point there's a work of satire five times in the email, you know, <laughs> just in case that's ever exhibit A in, 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 in the trial. So, um. Uh, I mean, he seems, you know, much like the Germans, someone who would probably take a joke well, um, but 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 you just never know. Uh, I haven't, you, you, you know, I haven't I haven't heard from them. We do. Have, I have sort of one um, friend who, uh, until recently, dated someone who worked at SpaceX, and I kind of thought that would be my uh, um, be my way in. But unfortunately, they, they yeah. yeah, well, but they're no longer longer together, which is a problem. But the good news is that that means we now get to call her ex-boyfriend the spacex so so, so 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 that person is now universally referred to as the spacex so 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 we're not any further forward with getting you know sign off from elon musk but we do have a good nickname for a friend's ex-boyfriend so so that's uh, that's something in the modern world silver lining sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right well before we take the questions so one of the, the one of the Fun, one of the funnest parts that I um, had in this book is um, the movies, but you don't give the titles. So it was like, oh, yeah. that's Thelma and Louise. Oh, that's Love Story. Oh, that's Blade Runner. And then there were a couple and I, I was like, wait, is it this? And so what, what gives with leaving the titles out? Yeah, yeah, gr gr great question. I mean, I think kind of what I wanted to do was I, I I wanted it to be hopefully not too much inside baseball like, like I think obviously like I love it you know when people get the references that's totally fine but my intention my hope was that you could read the book and it would still work without knowing so 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 so, so, so the idea being that you know we're, we're seeing every everything through Jared's eyes and kind of what matters more isn't so much what the actual movie is um but is is what Jared's experience of, of, of the movie is. 
so that was kind of my hope. Um, I, I know that people definitely like to know, you know, what the movies are. If, if anyone's wondering about what a particular movie is, I'm on Twitter, you know, get at me. I'm very happy to tell you uh, which, uh, which, which movies, which the, the one that people seem to not often know is um, uh, the, the, the love story between um, the handsome bank robber and the U.S. Marshal. Um, uh, the, oh. the, so, so sort of all about the meat cute and the, and they go to the penitentiary where some of this movie took place because if you remember the the, the way these people meet is the handsome bank robber is uh, escaping from the penitentiary and uh, kidnaps the, the beautiful US Marshal on, on, on the way um, and that movie is the movie Out of Sight yes. uh, from, from 2000 with, uh, with uh, the most handsome bank rob robber of all time which is George Clooney and the most beautiful US Marshal of all time which is Jennifer Lopez and it's really just you know it's one of my favourite movies I think it's it's such a it's from an Elmore, Elmore Leonard book but it got you know hugely changed I think necessarily um, uh, and I it's Steven Soderbergh directed it and it's just for me it, it's it's really kind of like what I love in a movie, which it's, you know, it's Soderbergh, so it's art and it's smart and it's got, you know, heart, but it's also really tells a great story. You, 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 you know, it's just, it's just, if anyone hasn't seen that movie, that's a, that's a, that's a strong, a strong recommend from me is, is, is Out of Sight from, from 2000. That was one that I had to think about for a while because I was like, okay, I think it's that movie with George Clooney and Jennifer Lopez and I couldn't get the title for the longest yep. time. And then, but I was like, I think that's it. So yeah, oh. yeah, it, it, it's funny to me that movie isn't more popular than it is. You know, you know, I really think it's it's one of the greats. But yeah, it didn't it didn't quite, you know, connect so much. I think. I think wasn't that kind of the start of George Clooney's career? Like when he was just getting started. It was like the middle so 90s you, maybe yeah kathy you are absolutely right and, and i know this because i once went to a talk that steven soderbergh the director did and he told this brilliant story where he so he had directed the movie sex lies and videotape which won uh, the can won the palm door you know so he was the big hot thing and oh, yeah. but he couldn't he couldn't get a studio movie like, like, like no one was going to trust him with you know whatever the budgets the 50 million dollars budget were and he said that this one project came his way and it was out of sight and he read the script and it was absolutely fantastic. And he said, this is great, but why, you know, why isn't someone else doing this? Like, like, why is this coming to me? Because, you know, normally this would be snapped up. And the studio said, well, there's a problem. There's, there's an actor attached to it. And he said, okay, who's the actor? And they said, well, the actor's George Clooney. And the problem was, believe it or not, at that time, George Clooney was considered a TV star. He oh, was from, from Facts ER. of Life. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and there was such a division in those days between TV and movies mm -hmm. that it was thought impossible that a George Clooney could ever become a movie star because you start and I mean isn't that insane you, 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 you know but but that was and and so kind of why I guess why sort of got the movie and why you know Clooney got to do it was because they were both kind of in that same point in their career where they needed someone to some so, 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 someone to take a chance on them so so, so yeah I guess you, you know it gave us George Clooney so 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 it did it did pretty great um, <laughs> yay out of sight so, all right, well, let's take some questions. Olivia, do we have questions from, from our audience? Oh, I don't hear you. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. Good, all right. So yes, we do have some questions. The first one that popped up um, is, is it difficult to write in a Midwestern American voice or do you find it difficult? Wow. Well, well, this seems like a p p p potentially a, 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 a trick question because I think you know, you know, you you can probably tell me much better as to as as to whether I got the Midwestern American voice right or not. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, I, I think I, I suppose there's a question of like, is um, how how Midwestern is, is is Jared? I mean, certainly he was he was made he was manufactured at the uh, the, the robotics plant on K Street in Detroit. But he's probably. I, I think he. I think he has the. You, you know, he certainly has the soul of a Midwesterner in terms of his kindness and his compassion and his wanting to do the right thing and be nice. But I suppose his voice is probably, you know, it, it, his voice is still more sort of like a like an android who's who, who's trying to sound human. So I probably made things easy for myself by that that I have a a ready-made excuse that I can say, well, you know, he's not actually supposed to sound that much like a Midwesterner. He's supposed to sound um, l l l like an Android. But but that said, so many of the, um, uh, you, you know, so many of the writers I grew up loving were kind of from the Midwest. So, so I was always obsessed with Scott Fitzgerald. Um, 
Hemingway's in there. Uh, I had a big Garrison Keillor phase. So, 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 so I feel like pro- 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 probably those voices have probably all filtered into my into my writing anyway. And in fact, probably if I probably tried to write something set in Scotland now, they would probably sound Midwestern. So. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Our next uh, question is more of a, oh, we had just had another question pop up. Okay. Um, one uh, listener says, looking forward to reading the book. Just curious which Pixar screenplays you wrote or worked on. So, 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 so it's a great question. Um, unfortunately, I am, they're very secretive over there. And the movie has not been uh, 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 announced or released yet so, so, so unfortunately i i don't think i can say um so, so so it's not one that's out yet um i can also say it's it's not a sequel and i think they should be announcing it fairly soon i, I should also say that you know they're very much um collaborative efforts so you know it will probably be my name and you, you know you know several other s- 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 several other names as well but um uh, i i did work on one that is uh, that the is forthcoming, but I'm afraid that's probably if the, the the contracts there are amazing because they um if you you have to sign this contract that says that if you give away, you know, the movie, then uh, they can sue you for the entire budget of the movie, and those movies ad- average about five hundred million dollars. So uh, so that's a very good incentive not to um, <laughs> not, not 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 to say, even though I'm desperate to. Um, <laughs> not worth on, the risk. You worked on um. A movie that you can't didn't. Gosh, I don't yes, want to get you in that, trouble. Yes, that's right. Paddington. Yeah, yeah, yes, no, 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 no. So Paddington Two, in fact, and and yeah, I I can definitely talk about that because because that okay. was out in the world. Um, uh, I, I, I mean that one. Um, uh, it, it's funny. So, so, so the Paddington movies are very much the the, the brainchild of, of the director. So, so Paul King, who's the writer and director, and he actually has another writer. He works with another Simon, Simon Farnaby. As you know, there's this great joke in America that all British people are called Simon. It's true. Uh, you know, there was another Simon uh, that, that wrote most of that Paddington movie. Um, I had worked with the director a bit on something else, and so they had some moment when uh, I think Simon Farnaby was going off to shoot another movie or something, and so. Uh, I, I went and did a bit of work with, uh, with 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 Paul on it, but in truth, it's it's a sort of it's a very he's very collaborative, but it's really or it's you know he's he's really the um, uh, he, he's he, he's 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 really the bra- the, bra- the brains of it. Um, uh, but it's funny. I think it's one of the only movies with a hundred percent on Rotten Tomatoes. So, so I'm definitely happy to state, oh, state my state, state state my small claim. My, my credit, I think, <laughs> is addi- additional material, which I think is fair. <laughs> So we talked about, uh, we had a couple questions crop up in book club that I've been yeah. asked to ask you. Um, and one of the words that we kept coming up with uh, was cinematic and that the book felt cinematic, which goes along with what we were just talking about there. But um, is that something uh, you thought about when you were writing it? Do you think about it? I mean, is there a way that you can differentiate between your screenplay writing and your novel writing? Or do you, do you kind of see it the same way? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the, the, this is really fascinating, and, it, and it's something I, I've been wondering about a lot because, so one of the kind of one of the origins of this book was um, book that really changed my life this past decade was Jennifer Egan's A Visit from the Goon Squad, and I'm sure you know everyone loved that book. It's fantastic, and I saw her talk once. She came to the Edinburgh Book Festival. I'm from Edinburgh, and uh, she um, she explained that she knew that she wanted to write about music. But she she felt that the sort of like linear storytelling wasn't a way to capture the kind of polyphonic sense of of, of the music that, that she loved. And so she wanted to write something that was more polyphonic, which was where she got to the idea of a collection of short stories that were all interlinked and all the rest of it. And, you know, I heard her say that and I thought, that's amazing. That's so incredible. Uh I'll file that away because that's such a genius thought. You know, I'm sure it would be of no relevance to anything I ever do, but let's file that away. And then some, sometime after I had the um, the Android screenwriting, uh, the, the screenwriting Android thought come into my head <coughs> when I began to think of, well, what's the shape of this? What does this novel feel like? And uh, I kind of realized that what I wanted to do was when I decided the kind of movies that Jared was going to be watching, which were those great big movies of the 90s and the, the 80s, the early 2000s, um, I, I set myself the goal of I wanted to give someone reading my book the experience that I get when I watch one of those movies. 
And what happens to me when I watch one of those movies is I go on this kind of roller coaster of emotion. And ultimately, at the end, I feel this great sense of catharsis. So I was I was consciously trying to kind of mimic the um, the structure of those movies, and um, which I think probably goes, you know, partly to why to why the book fit, fit, fit feels a bit like that. Um, and then I guess and, and you know, if I was clever and cynical, or more clever and more cynical than I am, uh, I would have thought this is a great way to you know, get a book that might be, to write a book that might be a movie someday. But that genuinely wasn't the, wasn't the plan at all. I just, I was desperate to write a novel and, and this was it. And it was a lucky, really like, and it wasn't until I sat down to begin the adaptation for the screen that I was like, oh, hang on, this is, this is already the right shape, <laughs> which was great. Um, so, um, uh, but it does, it then poses the question of, you know, I, I'm sort of beginning to play around with the next novel and, uh, um, you know, I now have the much harder task, I think, which is how do I write something that doesn't have this shape and structure that I'm so sort of familiar with. So, um, so yeah, that's that 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 that's the big the 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 the, the, the big current challenge for me is 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 kind of thinking th thinking about that uh, about how because I love stories that have this kind of shape and feel and um. But you know, equally, I also loved a Visit from the Kunzgorn. I love you know novels that don't follow this classic um shape so 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 that's that's what's next is it, trying to work out uh how and if I, I can work some i can write something that doesn't have that shape so do you want to i mean do, or would you rather write something with that shape or is that uh, like the fun challenge to try to not do that i i i think it's fun to try something else like like, like, like i'm such a huge fan of um uh, someone, someone like Ishiguro, you, you, you know, who just every novel is just different, and 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 I would love to think that like, I think each each kind of story has its perfect natural shape. So like, you know, the perfect natural shape for this story about uh, an android who's a screenwriter is is the shape of of a, 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 a sort of big movie. And likewise, you know, I think Jennifer Egan found the perfect shape for a, a visit from the Goon Squad. So 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 so, so I think for me, it's going to be more like trying to let the let the let the material dictate the shape i think I, I, um, but but i agree that like i definitely you know there, there's something i intrinsically like about you know a roller coaster and an emotional catharsis at the end right 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 i think as humans we we naturally relate to that shape but i think i think the challenge for me now is is yeah is, is to try something else so um, another question was, Jared had uh, that reference book, uh, that how to write screenplays reference yes. book. I can't, I didn't write down the title, but um, that was ex really interesting. And you, you know, quoted from that book. Um, did you have something like that for your novel or did you have a novel that really informed how you wanted to write the book? Wow, great, great question. So I think... Um, so, 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 so the book is, is, is 20 Golden Rules of Screenwriting, um, and, 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 and it's not a real book, but they are all kind of, all of those rules are things that you hear endlessly as a screenwriter. And it's sort of, it's, it's kind of endlessly fascinating to me that um, there are, you, you know, if, if you go to the, you know, creative writing section of, of, of the bookstore, you know, there are just shelves of books telling, like instruction manuals, how to write a screenplay. Um, and there, those don't seem to exist for 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 for, for, for novels, um, which I, rightly so, I think, be, 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 because I think um, uh, I, I, I guess there is more freedom in a novel. I, th I think in a, you know, certainly a bigger movie, you know, there's certain things we expect. We expect we're going to be, you know, at least told a story over the hour and a half, and. Um, nothing annoys me more than, than going to the movies and not being told a story, you know, you had one job, you know, what, what, one job. Um, uh, so um, I didn't have, I, I didn't have a, a, some sort of guide like that for novel writing, I think, but again, I think it was so informed by the screenwriting that actually I did have this fallback safety net that what I was trying to do was emulate that structure. And I kind of knew the structure I was, I was, I was trying to emulate, I, I, I think was probably the, um, so, so, so anyway, I probably followed, I mean, I did follow some of those screenwriting rules because, y y y you know, the big rule of, um, the 20th golden rule of a character must change, y you know, which really is the big, 
the big rule at the heart of screenwriting and um, for better or for worse. And, uh, and, you know, that was definitely a goal I was kind of writing to with Jared that I wanted him to have changed from, from who he was at the beginning to, 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 to who he was at the end. Uh, another patron asked, and this might be relevant, who was your favorite character to write? Ah, great. I mean, can I say Jared? Is, 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 that, is, that, is that cheating? I mean, I mean the, the, the real answer is Paddington. Uh, Pat Pat Paddington is, it is just so much fun because he's just just does everything that um, uh, you know. I'm quite a clumsy person, and 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 just you know everything that I worry about doing, he just does. You, you know, walks into tins of paint and stuff. Um, uh, in, 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 in in this book, um, I so 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 Dr. Glunderstein, of course, is a uh, he's a physician who wishes he was a screenwriter. Um, I'm a physician who became a screenwriter who uh, sometimes misses being a physician. So, 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 I quite enjoyed that as a sort of like exercise in, you know, the road not taken. That, that, like, 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 it was a good reminder to me that, you know, I, I, I made a choice and there was reasons for my, for, for, for my choice. Do we have other questions? Yeah, we have we have one more question than a comment that I saved to the end because it was a lovely comment. But I'll ask. Uh, there's a question here. Uh, the bot hunting, bot hunting was uh, disturbing. Were you influenced by current events? Um. Wow. It's a great question. Yeah. So, um. I mean, I I I appreciate the comment because because it was supposed to be, you know, a bit disturbing in terms of I wanted it to be you know, very clear that, you know, whilst we're having a lot of fun with Jared and all the rest of it, that, you know, he's in danger, you know, and, and, and people are treating him, you know, badly. And, and, you know, there's people that really want to hurt him in the world for no reason. And I think, um, I mean, in terms of current events, like I, I probably wrote this book before, you know, obviously things have kind of taken a darker turn in the past couple of years. And w w when I began to write this book was probably 2017. So there was already you know, the, the outgoing administration were, were, were already in office. And similarly in Britain, I think we'd already voted for Brexit, which is why there's uh, an English refugee in the book actually is because that's probably the, you know, if you extrapolate Brexit, you know, there's the, you know, that Britain becomes the poorest country in the world. I can say that because I'm British. Um, uh, um, and, and so with them, um, with that, I mean, it's, so, so it wasn't really, um, uh, I, I didn't have in mind, you know, probably some, some of the parallels which, which seem more direct now, but I mean, more like it was just about, I think, you, you know, the dangers of othering, right? And, and, and the, you know, whether that's, you know, just on, on like an, an individual level in our day-to-day -day lives or, or whether that's, you know, with a, you know, a different group of people or something. I think, you know, Jared's, Jared's quest is he just, he just wants to belong. You know, he just wants to feel like he's welcome and he's part of things. And I think as humans, you know, we, we all have that sense. And uh, I think um, I, w I didn't want to, yeah, I probably didn't want to draw any like overly heavy sort of analogies or something beyond just, you know, I, I, I guess just talking about, to just make an extreme example of, of how 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 dangerous it is to be the other sometimes, and and how and, and just just to make him feel yeah yeah more alone and outside. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I'll read the lovely comment too before I throw okay. it over to you guys. Um, uh, Jared's understanding of human nature um, and how it's explained so accurately is very telling of the author's awareness and intuition. I expect that comes from his background in health. So while I laughed out loud, I could also appreciate the astute truths of us as humankind. I thoroughly enjoyed this novel and someone else wrote in to say that they enjoyed reading it too. Well, well that's very kind and uh, thank you. I, uh, that really, really means a great deal to me because you know, the, you know, I think you know, much as Jared's journey is you know, writing in the hope of finding connection, I think as, as writers that's you know, that's what we're trying to do as well, right? Is, is, is we're trying to find connection and trying to, you know, re relate to our fellow humans. And, and there's nothing more gratifying than when someone reads something and, and, and does relate to it. So, so, so thank you. Yay. So, so you're working on the next book. The screenplay is in progress. Can you tell us anything yep. about the possible movie? 
Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so uh, with and, and I can say this is all in the public domain. So, um, I the, the 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 big thing about movies is, is is what helps movies happen is directors like like. like you know, if I'd known this, I may not have chosen to become a screenwriter, but I didn't know this 20 years ago when, 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 when I started out. So, so the directors are, are, are really the, um, uh, they're the, they're the, the people that, that make things happen. Um, and I got very lucky because one of, you know, to my mind, the greatest directors in the world, Edgar Wright, who uh, people might know from Baby Driver was his most recent movie, but he also made Shaun of the Dead and The World's End and Hot Fuzz. So all, all those really great fun movies. Um, he read the book and, and liked it. And so um, that meant that, you know, we were kind of off the, off the races in terms of, um, you know, a studio came on board. And so I've now... I've written a screenplay. Um, things are obviously, you know, with the pandemic, th things are sort of not entirely clear, both in terms of how you make a movie, but then also how you show it, right? Because, uh, you know, our cinemas aren't, aren't, aren't flourishing right now. And I think we're all, you know, hopeful that um, they will, they'll, they'll survive. So um, I think um, we're kind of, we're, we're, we're sort of at this like slightly funny point where, you know, the script's done. And I think we're sort of, just slightly waiting to see what the world looks like. And I, and I think things are, you know, a lot of my friends in Los Angeles kind of work on the crew on films and they do seem to be sort of ramping back up. You know, they seem to have ways, you know, they've got some testing protocols and they've got, you know, they, they, seem, they seem to be starting to, starting to make things. Um, so so, so, so I'm, I'm hopeful that, that there'll, there'll be a movie of this before too long, but um, I've also been, you know, out in Los Angeles long enough to know that, you know, they always tell you never to get excited until the cameras start rolling. Um, and probably in this day and age, you know, you probably shouldn't get too excited until they finish rolling, I would imagine. <laughs> Well, I'm keeping my fingers crossed because I love the movies and I would love to see this as a movie and um, Edgar Wright too, you know, Scott Pilgrim versus the world. And that was right, so exactly. yes. visual and, you know, pulling you out and then, you know, taking you in and all the effects and everything. And I just, when I heard that he was directing, I was like, oh, perfect. Because some of the cutaway scenes or the um, things that. I, I think that's exactly right. I think it'd be so fantastic about it. And then the other thing, and it seems an odd thing to say because like, of course, all film directors are, are great cinephiles, but he is really one of the great cinephiles. Like, like I, I follow him on Twitter and sometimes he posts, you know, the movies he's been watching over quarantine and it's just these, you know, huge stacks of, of, of movies. And, and he was actually, he, he, he read the book in manuscript and, and he helped me out because I did a, uh, I, I made a very silly mistake where uh, I, Jared, uh, one of the movies Jared talks about when he goes to the Griffith Park Observatory is he talks about this movie in which this teenager um, uh, gets in this knife fight and the movie is Rebel, Rebel Without a Cause and there's a statue to, to James Dean up there at Griffith Park. Um, and I used that to spin off and talk about, in the original manuscript, to talk about black and white movies and how they were, you know, precious and beautiful and stuff. Um, and he very kindly in our first call said, look, you know, I just, you know, I, I just think if I was you, I'd want to know, but you know, you've got this passage. And the thing is that Rebel Without a Course isn't in black and white. It's actually famously in glorious Technicolor. Like it's one of the most famous movies in Technicolor there is. And James Dean's jacket is red, you know, and we use that same jacket in Baby Driver to pay a red homage to that. And I was like, wow, okay, yeah. And, and I was so puzzled because I was like, well, you know, if Edgar Wright says it's in Technicolor, of course it's in Technicolor. However, I very clearly remember seeing this in black and white, and and so 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 I went googling, and and I was I was sure I must have seen some weird cut or some print or some like you know on television or something, and it turns out I had never seen Rebel Without a Cause. What I'd seen was uh, Rumblefish, uh, oh. the 1983 Francis Ford Coppola film, which also has has a motorbike in it and a guy in a leather jacket, but the guy in the leather jacket um, is not James Dean; he's Nicolas Cage. Which, which 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 is which is very different. So anyway, we're very lucky to have a, a, a true cinephile um, uh, on on the case because otherwise the the manuscript would have had this terrible error in it, uh, apart from anything else. And also, he's going to make a brilliant movie. But um, uh, yeah, he saved my bacon already, so that was great. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. Well, I I I'm so sad that we are at the end of our time. Um, I just really want to thank you, Simon, for, for hanging out with us and spending more time in the Midwest with the Midwest audience and um, talking to me again. And just know, please, that we wish you the very best. And we're, we're cheering for you. And we hope that you'll come back and talk to us with the next book. 
Absolutely, and and you know, thank you guys. Thank you for all your support. It's been it's been an absolute thrill. I've I've you know enjoyed this conversation a ton, and you know, my thanks to to the fruit group for for reading the book again. I super appreciate that, and uh, yeah, definitely see you next time. Cool. Yes, when your next book comes out, you got the book group audience covered. So. Wonderful. Great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Well, enjoy enjoy your vacation. Happy birthday to your girlfriend. Stay away from fires, um, and just be be careful out there. Perfect. Yep. Likewise. Yep. Absolutely. It's a tough time. We're all gonna. gonna be happy. And right faster. Okay. Yeah. That's that next. <laughs> Great. Thank you, guys. Thanks Thank everybody you. for joining us. We'll see you next time. Have a good night. Thank you.